for another edition of Chicago Line. Thanks for uh, yeah taking on that weather. There are two bathrooms. This one may be uh, out of order. I'm not sure. This one can be used. I was told there'll be pizza on the way. Now Alyssa is out today. The one uh, the uh, person who handles all that. So if pizza comes in, just go back and uh, get a slice. We've got soda pop and Monster and some beer in the back. And without further ado, message cues and go by Chris. Please give a warm welcome. Thank you. Uh, again, for coming out on a crappy day. Uh, I'm going to be jiggling my laptop mouse every now and again because I didn't bring a power cord. Um, so, like Ted said, I'm Chris Agux. Um, I've been using message cubes for a few years now. Um, at a company I was at in Atlanta called Carolytics, uh, we used uh, RabbitMQ and Intel uh, WebSphere MQ, which was interesting. And then here at Backstop in Chicago, we use RabbitMQ and ActiveMQ. Just uh, ActiveMQ we use to manage our services. RabbitMQ we um, are using in production. It's been rock solid. Um, there are a whole lot of different queue brokers out there. The vast majority of them uh, run the AMQP protocol, uh, which is what I'm going to speak to. I'm using RabbitMQ running in the Docker instance, um, but it should apply to any AMQP compliant queue broker. Just what I, you know, what I've written for, you know, written everything against. So, um, and again, I don't know everybody's kind of skill level, knowledge level, so I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up. So, message queues, message queue brokers. What are they good for? What do they do? Hey. What are they? Um, a queue broker is a server that sits out there that provides queues and uh, routes messages to queues. A message is anything. It could just be, you know, a little block of JSON. It could be a big uh, thick lob. Sort of whatever you want to throw on the queue, you can throw it on the queue. It's completely agnostic to content. Uh, so what's it good for? Uh, you can pass messages between services. You can build distributed microservices, which seems to be kind of the new hotness nowadays. Um, they're really good at handling burstiness. So you can throw a whole lot of data at a queue, a whole lot of messages at a queue, and just have it run through. You know, while you're uh, while you're whatever's processing the messages can, and they're good at asynchronous processing. So if you don't care that you have the results of whatever you ask them to do, just so long as you have eventual consistency, that's beautiful. That's exactly why you want cubes. So let's pretend for a minute. Let's pretend that you and me and all of you are working together at a small software consultancy, and we get contacted by a major financial institution. And they have a problem. And what's the problem? Harry's dead. Harry is the man who uh, wrote the 10 million lines of COBOL that handle all debit card transactions. He's the only one left alive who still understands that he was hit by a truck yesterday. So they have a big problem on their hands. They want to replace this 10 million lines of COBOL running on a uh, big IBM server with distributed microservices and they want us to build it. So that's what we're going to do for the course of this talk. So let's talk a minute about debit card processing. Um, man, I have not been using my cards. Let's talk a minute about debit card processing. Uh, we want to accept incoming transactions. We want to check for fraud. We want to send a success or failure message. Uh, we know there's going to be a high volume of messages coming in. You can't tell from minute to minute exactly what that's going to be, so we want to build a scale. Um, so how are we going to do it? We're going to, like I said, build microservices, throw all the messages on the queue for a backbone to talk between them. It's going to be beautiful. So what do we get kind of just built in? The transactions come in via magic. It could be them pushing it to us through a REST endpoint. <coughs> we could be pulling it for them. It doesn't really matter. Knowing big banks, they're probably dumping into a text file and throwing it into a place that we need to suck up because uh, that's how they've worked for ages. Uh, we get the Fraudovac, which is a very big, old, creaky device that super fast checks for fraud. And IBM wrote them a 100 year support contract, so as long as they keep it oiled with goat's blood, it works really well. Um, so we don't need to worry about replacing that, we just need to talk back and forth to it. And we get, finally, uh, messaging to the cardholder. So we can say, yes, 
your, uh, your transaction went through, or no, your transaction did not go through, or hey, we got a transaction and it looks fishy to you, to us. So let's whiteboard. I was actually really hoping I would have a whiteboard here. Um, that's disappointing. But I'm going to wave my hands around. So let's say over here we've got uh, transactions coming in. So we need to build a device to receive the transactions, throw them onto a queue. We need to build a device that takes these transactions, communicates them to the FAUDAVAC, and then accepts the responses from the FAUDAVAC. And then we need to uh, look at successful transactions, send them to one place, look at failed transactions, send them to another place, and then take an aggregate of all transactions that have gone through the FAUDAVAC, success or failed, and put them in a third place. I hope that makes sense. Uh, I will probably be referring to points in space as I talk. So let's talk a little bit about uh, kind of the basics of a uh, message queue brother. Uh, I'm going to just throw some terminology around, so I'm going to go through the terminology before I go through it. Pizza is here, so I'll probably go through this slide and then we'll get to pizza. Um, a connection is a long-lived TCP connection. You, uh, for each producer or consumer, you probably only need one or two active connections. Uh, your Go routines can share connections. Um, it's expensive to create, expensive to destroy, but fortunately you can use it for, you, can, you know, a whole lot of things can use one connection simultaneously. Um, a channel, and I know there's also channels in Go, but I'm going to use channel to be an AMQP channel. I don't think I'm going to refer to Go chans, but if I do, I'll call it a chan, not a channel. Uh, a channel is kind of a short-lived, disposable, communication pipe between the uh, client and the uh, key broker. Excuse me. Um, you can create and destroy them super fast on the fly. You can uh, do it once per, you can create a one channel per message, or you can, uh, you know, batch messages up and send a whole bunch across the channel. But really, you don't have to worry about uh, creating a strong channel because they're super cheap and lightweight. If you'd like to break your pizza, please do.
All right, so that's where I might see. That's why I made a mistake. Okay. Uh, third thing on this list that I put on a different card, which is why I forgot, is an exchange. An exchange is a uh, it, it's an artifact that lives in the key of rubber that routes messages. And uh, for every message that comes in, you publish it to an exchange, uh, and the exchange routes it to zero or more queues, depending upon what queues are bound to the exchange and uh, what information is attached to the message that tells the exchange how to route it. So finally, the, uh, the big topic is queues. Um, the queue acts very much like a queue in software, in you know, computer science. It's a container that holds objects, and in this case, these objects are messages, and it holds them in some order. Um, typically, it's a first and first out, but you can assign priority to messages, and a high priority message will skip ahead uh, over the lower priority messages. Um, when you create a queue, you bind it to an exchange, and when you do that, you can even uh, tell the queue to be subscribed to a topic. So, um, if two types, uh, I'm going to go into this in a second, but if two types of messages are coming into an exchange, they could be routed to one queue or the other queue, depending. Um, you can name queues, uh, which would be useful if you had sort of a work queue, where you had a bunch of messages, each of which needs to be processed only once, and you have several different consumers on that. Or you can have uh, nameless queues, where uh, when a consumer creates the queue and connects to the queue, uh, that queue exists only for that consumer. So you have a message that could be routed to three different queues, um, and a copy would be delivered to each queue, and a copy would be received by each consumer. And you can use these to construct sort of fantastically complex routing schemes, uh, depending upon how you want your messages to fly. So I talked about routing. Uh, routing typically occurs uh, based on a routing key. And a routing key is a, typically just a string that is assigned to the message, and it tells the exchange where to route it. And the routing key is typically in sort of a dotted word form. So let's say, for example, you had like a prod, you were, you, were, you know, putting log messages on a queue, and you can have prod.warning, and dev.debug, and if you wanted, uh, for example, to subscribe to a queue that looks for all the error messages across all of your uh, different environments, you would have octothorpe.error, and uh, you know any kind of prod.error, staging.error, dev.error that occur would go to that queue and be consumed by whatever consumers are attached to that queue. Uh, finally, if you want to listen to every different, uh, to every message that comes across in one particular environment, you can have staging dot um, So every every staging message would be uh, routed to that queue. So what happens is, and I'm going to show you this in, this in code in a second. But you declare a queue, you bind it to an exchange, you subscribe it to a topic, uh, and then the exchange handles the routing. So you have a couple different types of exchange. A direct exchange, uh, there's a one-to-one -one routing key to queue mapping. So it, it uh, doesn't do any kind of fancy matching. You have a different kind of exchange, it's called a fan out, that also doesn't do any fancy matching, but every message that comes into that exchange gets distributed to every queue that is uh, bound to that exchange. You have a topic exchange uh, that does the fancy routing key matching that I was describing earlier. So each queue subscribes to a topic on that exchange, and that exchange handles the routing that way. And finally, you have a uh, header exchange that works very similar to a topic exchange, only it ignores the uh, routing key, and it pays attention to um, arbitrary header information that you can uh, pass with the AMQP message. All very useful. So it's going to be code time in a second. I'm using the uh, Stregway AMQP package. Uh, it's kind of the main AMQP package for Go. I looked around, I couldn't find any others that were seriously developed. Uh, it's very similar to a lot of other AMQP packages in other languages, and I found that it works very well and it's used correctly, very different, as you would expect. So let's talk for a second about making a connection. Um, you guys in the back seat? Okay? Good enough? Okay. And this is simple. Um, 
But pretty much you're just assembling a URL. Uh, I've got this pointing to my, uh, what is it, my AMQP Docker container that's running on my local machine. Um, and then you just tell amqp.dial and it creates a connection for you. And then you do all the typical go flying error handling. Uh, making a channel, same stuff, easy stuff. Um, you ask that connection to give you a channel, it creates a channel for you, hands it back. Uh, you asked earlier, yes, a connection does provide the channel. Um, and every channel goes over a connection. Declaring a queue, now this is interesting. Um, whenever you create a producer or a consumer, you declare a queue. And you can declare a queue as many times as you want. It just ensures that that queue exists in that queue broker uh, at that time. And actually, a uh, uh, fun kind of how-to with uh, AMQP, when you declare a queue, you can ask the queue broker to tell you the size of the, the, the queue depth, effectively. So uh, how I log queue depth, every time I go to declare, you know, I create a new channel, and then I declare a queue for every message I want to store. I check and see what the queue depth is, and then I log that. Typically, it's zero, because stuff goes super fast. Um, in this particular example, uh, my key was called transaction fire hose. So that's the fire hose of transactions that's coming at us. Um, I'll go through the, the options. It's kind of just gloss over them real quick because there's a whole ton of different options that you can use. Uh, this is a durable queue, so it'll survive a restart. Uh, I've set auto delete to false, which means that uh, the queue will not be deleted by the all. Um, Consumers unsubscribing. Uh, the queue is not exclusive, which an exclusive queue would mean that only one consumer could consume from it at a time. And I have told this operation not to be in no wait mode, which means that the server will respond. So it will wait for the response from the server once it declares the queue. There's a lot of negatives in that sentence. Uh, publishing a message. Uh, I'm telling it what exchange to publish to. Kind of empty string is the default exchange. I am, which is a uh, direct exchange, by the way. I'm telling it what uh, routing key to use, so that's the queue name. So I mean, it's a one-to-one -one relationship uh, between this routing key and this queue name. Um, it is a mandatory which means that uh, the, the broker, if the message is unroutable, the broker says, hey, there's an error. Uh, it's not immediate, where immediate would mean that it has to be consumed immediately, and if it's not consumed immediately, then errors happen. And I'm setting a priority to zero. So let's, let's run this. Should work. Fingers are crossed. All right, so we've published one message to the queue. Right, I can't do that. And I can actually go over here to the RabbitMQ control panel. And you can see the graph has gone up. And there we go. One single solitary message sitting on this uh, RabbitMQ instance. So we'll go back. That's fun. So we've got a message. Let's, go. Dang it. Let's consume this message. Um, again, our consumer, all consumers are uniquely named. You can. Uh, provide a unique name for the consumer or you can pass an empty string, which means that the key broker provides it a random unique name. Uh, Autobac, I've set to true. I'm going to get into that in a second. Well, you shouldn't do that. Um, exclusive is set to false. That means that this is not the only consumer consuming on this queue. Uh, no local is also set to false. Yes, is also set to false, which means that I can produce and consume on the same connection. Um, you can do that, it's fine. Uh, but you can also tell it not to breach the consume on the same connection if you want to do that. Uh, and then finally, I've got it in no wait, which means that it won't, ex you know, there won't be an exception if there's nothing immediately to consume. So I'll go ahead and consume off this guy. All right, so I got a message, blah, blah. And that's exactly what I put on. And we can actually go up here, look at our avenue control panel. You can see that we have delivered one message, 
And there we go, our message line has fallen back down to zero. That's awesome. This is exactly what I wanted to see. So I'm going to kill this and close it. Because it'll just sit and spin consuming all day long if, if you set it to do that. So let's talk about the right way to consume. Uh, I showed you AutoAct being true. What AutoAct does is it automatically acknowledges the message once you've consumed it off the queue. That's kind of dangerous and wrong because let's say you create a consumer that goes off and does like a five minute process and it crashes. Uh, then you've got some messages that have been dropped on the floor. So what you want to do is you want to consume the message off the queue, go do your processing, and then acknowledge that that message has been appropriately handled. Uh, so you can see I've set auto act to false here, and I'm manually acknowledging the message here. And the uh, false that I'm passing to d.ac is don't acknowledge every message prior to this one also. Because you can do that. You can acknowledge as many messages as you want at a time. So is there a timeout? Uh, if you hang on to a message for five minutes? I believe there is. I believe it's configurable. Okay. So let's throw another message onto the queue. Consume it correctly. Hey, Presto, it works. So I'm going to uh, now talk a little bit about the, the fraud detection section. I actually I really should have called this exchanges because we're <coughs> creating and handling exchanges now. Um, but to kind of to go back to the bank example, we've uh, handled grabbing messages from the uh, from the transaction firephones, and now we're going to be passing them to and reading them from the uh, fraud back. So right here we are declaring ooh, declaring an exchange. I'm going to call it the uh, post fraud exchange because we're going to be taking messages off the queue, processing them, and then handing them back to the post fraud exchange. Um, I should tell you all that basically I just copied almost exactly the same code, like the same hundred lines over and over again for all these examples. <laughs> It's, it's so simple and okay, now to do it. Um, so we've got this post-fraud exchange, it's a topic exchange, and uh, basically I did a lot of blah, 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 blah here, uh, which is the various configurations that can go on to an exchange. You know, I don't really care, you don't really care. We all have more, we, we don't have that much time in our day. Um, so here's kind of the, the magic, if you will, of the fraud detection. It goes into a incredibly complex algorithm called CoinFlip. And what CoinFlip does is it determines if the router key is going to be transaction.success or transaction.failure. Um, so then we create the message and we publish the message to the exchange using the router key that we've just decided. And the exchange again is post-transaction exchange, post-fraud exchange. We publish that message to the exchange. So let's go ahead and queue up a bunch of messages. I'm going to run this just a few times. <clears throat> and we go back over here and we run this. Fingers crossed. Come on, man. Don't be like that. <laughs> Okay, here we go. So we um, got a bunch of messages, blah, 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 blah. And we have published those messages to uh, transaction failure and transaction.success depending upon the result of our fraud detection software, as you can see. So now in theory we have queued up into two other queues, which I don't think I've declared yet. So these probably all got dumped on the floor, but I'm going to keep this running because it's going to keep processing messages as I send it through. Um, can't do that. I must do this. So let's talk about subscribing to a topic. Um, this is yet a third service. This is our log reading service. In fact, the top one, this is going to take every successful transaction that comes across, dispatch a message to the cardholder saying, hey, good job. You spent some money. Um, 
So what it's doing is it's uh, binding itself to a queue uh, called, I can't remember what I called this, probably called it uh, post, oh yeah I did, I called it success queue, I bet. Um, using the uh, routing key transaction.success and it's going to uh, suck off the exchange post fraud exchange and we'll expect of this. Uh, so I'm going to hit run. Okay, as expected, all those messages have been got dropped on the floor. But what I'm going to do is go over here. This is our transaction failure. And it's going to be running listening as well. So I'm going to go back over here. Let's throw another few messages down the pipe. All right, so that's five more messages. Come back here to our fraud detection. We can see that uh, we you know, handled a few more messages, decide whether they're good or evil. And here we go, our uh, three successes and two failures. Should be, yes, two failures, look at that. Now, let's take the last piece of the puzzle. That's going to be a piece over here that um, Every transaction that comes across successful or failure logs it so that the bank knows what's going on. Get you running. So the, the kind of key thing to see here is I'm subscribed to transactions.octoform, uh, which means transactions.wildcard. So every transactions dot message that comes across is going to be captured by this guy. It's going to be a, um, a copy of the same of the other message. So go back here, I'm going to create another oh, five. Another five transactions. The expenders over here. So we got our additional successful transactions. Here are our additional failed transactions. And here are our every transaction. It's going on to the log. And that is it. So uh, message queues are wonderful when it comes to microservices all talking together. If you have any questions, please ask me. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter, email, go to my website, whatever you want. I'll probably put this on my website today or tomorrow, and uh, you can read another article I've written about Go and Cubes also on my website. Right. Thank you. Uh, question. Did you end up using like, uh, gold channels, actually, or you were just working with the uh, uh, right in, in these examples, I completely ignore Go channels, um, Go routines rather. Yeah, Go channels and Go routines. I just ignore the fact that I had them because I didn't need them. Um, I have on here. I could probably get it running in about five minutes. A load tester that I use to load test uh, rather than a queue server at Backstop that um, use something like. 50 to 100 concurrent Go routines all just hammering rather than queue with messages, and another 50 to 100 Go routines consuming as fast as they possibly could. From Rabbit Duck? From Rabbit Duck, yes. Yeah, you're, uh, I think in that, one of those first couple of slides, you had the queue creation when you were going to queue create, asking the name and all that. Yes. <laughs> Whenever you're, on a later slide, when you were consuming from that queue, you were referencing that queue. Did you run that? Are you running that same queue create code every time and it's just if it already exists, grabbing queue just ignores it essentially? That's correct. Uh, it doesn't ignore it. More or less ensures that that queue does still exist because uh, queues are, they can be transient objects. So you can't assume that a queue exists or does not exist. Uh, what it does in this case is I'm declaring the queue again. And then Rabbit in queue says, okay, your queue exists and it's got however many messages on it. Will it modify if your options have changed between those two calls? Will it modify the queue? Or the I'm almost certain it will, but I do not know for sure. Do you know? Or not? I don't remember. You mentioned something like the queue could survive in the store. Like, no, no, I don't know. Like, you could like, press the button on the server and like, save the data. Yes. Uh, if it's a durable queue, I believe it will. Um, I don't know if that will work in my Docker instance, because uh, I'm probably throwing away all the hard drive data on restart. But yeah, if you have Rabbit queue running on bare metal or on a real VM, and it's durable, uh, it should survive and restart. The client that you're showing us here? Yeah. Um, will it 
in memory queue up messages. Like let's say your server goes down mm -hmm. for whatever reason and you keep doing more puts on the queue. Are they gonna queue up in memory until that server comes back over and reestablish your client connection? You can write your client to do that. Uh, not necessarily. So what will happen using the very simplistic thing that I wrote is uh, there'll probably be a I call it exception. Some of them will probably panic when you try to put onto that queue, uh, and it will uh, have you know if error is not nil, it'll panic. So hopefully that. Um, actually, can you go back to where you do the put on the queue? Yeah. I assume it returns like a, something in the error. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, you're not capturing the result. Yeah, no, I'm not capturing the result. <clears throat> I can. Um, I think what will actually happen here. To be honest, I don't know. I didn't expect that. And then, are are you responsible for knowing like if that if that channel's died, you need to reopen the channel yourself, or will this library take care of that? I'm responsible for reopening myself. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a more or less low level library. So you're passing messages with, <laughs> with like, uh, yeah, right there, my patch will not. Yeah. Uh, would you be able to use this as an inter uh, as a medium between two RESTful services? Is that where you would see, could see using that so that you could take an existing service or an architecture based in REST and turn it into an AMQP backed um, message boss backed service oriented architecture without yeah, much? You absolutely could. Um, you would, uh, let's say you guys. <laughs> Let's say you've got two uh, <clears throat> services that are talking back and forth by your rest. Um, kind of the key part to change out would be, you know, your receiving service is obviously receiving. You'd have to change that into a poll. Not really a poll, but, you know, you'd have to create your consumer, hook it up to the queue, and then act when your consumer got something, not when your uh, your web server receives right. something. Right. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be the change, right, between server accept and, and some sort of... Yeah, consumer. Exactly. Uh, but it would be an almost transparent change on the sender side. What would be the viable scenario for doing that? Um, for specifically for switching out REST-based services for a queue-based service or using a queue-based service? And it's kind of the same answer either way. Let's say you've got <laughs> service B, which is Indexing. So uh, for every you know big piece of text that comes in, it has to spend a while indexing and rebuilding your indexes. And then service A is just a receiver of documents to be indexed. So in service A, you say put you know this large chunk of text. Service A goes yes, okay, two hundred. Sends it over to service B. He says hey, index this guy. Please, would you? And service B handles the indexing. Um, if you are doing this REST based, you want to have a load balancer in front of service B, you probably want to put three or four service B's all handling the indexing simultaneously. Uh, you can get rid of the load balancer and you can pop in the queue here so you can handle more traffic. So service A, instead of, let's say you have a load balancer here, service A receives 600 requests all at once. It's going to go, you, 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 okay, 502 is no more, no more, no more. Uh, if you have a queue, it's going to say, okay, pop on the queue, 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 just keep popping down to the queue. Uh, you do it until the queue fills up, um, which is depending upon your implementation, like 40 or 50% of the available memory on the machine. Uh, RabbitMQ specifically will say, hey, no more at 40% of the available memory. Um, but if you're going crazy, you can cluster in your queues. Uh, to handle get more messages, and then your dutiful indexers over here would just consume off the queue, and yeah, they'd be consuming off the queue for like two, three days. But eventually, they would get all those documents off the queue and indexed. So that's kind of the key point: queues smooth out bursty traffic. So, okay. so this, you mentioned there's a scenario that you were talking about the bank and stuff. Yeah. Um, was it like real? It was almost real. Um, at Carlytics, we 
Yeah, so at Cardlytics, what happened was we were working with Bank of America serving their debit card rewards. And they wanted to do a thing where if you qualified for a reward at Starbucks and you went to Starbucks and you swiped your card, you would get an email or a text message or a push notification to your phone saying, hey, good job, you got your reward at Starbucks. Good for you. Um, so Bank of America said, okay, you guys build this. We said, okay, take all your card swipes and throw them onto a queue for us. And they use IBM Web Sierra queue because that's what they had in store. Um, and they were in queuing 8 to 1,200 transactions per second. And uh, yeah, it was maybe like a minimum of 400. Like the sustained, bur sustained max was 800, the burst max was about 1,200. Uh, we were dequeuing them as fast as we could, comparing these like dirty merchant names against uh, a Redis lookup that transformed dirty merchant names into clean merchant names, and then seeing if that person qualified for a reward, again with Redis, and then if so, and I can't remember, there are a few other different qualifiers. We were uh, putting a message onto yet another queue, saying, hey, dispatch a, a, a text or an email onto this guy. So we didn't necessarily bring queues in there, they handed us queues. But it was a really nice intro to message queues. <clears throat> you, you mentioned clustering uh, queues. Yes. What are some of the sort of considerations you have to deal with when you're clustering something like revenue queue? That I can't <clears throat> speak very well to. I'm more of a dev than an ops. Um, I really don't know kind of the trouble points you would hit. I do know, oh yes, I do know. Um, if one RabbitMQ instance in that cluster happens to hit some fixed percentage of the memory on the box, it will block all rights to that cluster, um, which is a bit of a pain. So you want to make sure that your smallest box is uh, sufficiently powerful. Um, but the good thing about clustering is it splits spreads the load across all the, all the machines. Uh, there are, I'm certain, other concerns that I can't think of in my head. We ran into that once at Backstop. Um, a different service was using the same queue cluster as us, and they kind of freaked out and queued a whole ton of messages at once, and it took us, it took the service that was using the queue down for a couple hours. So we figure out what's going on. We could dislodge all the error messages. <clears throat> so do you guys use Go with it right now, or do you just have? We don't changes? use Go in production code right now. Um, I'm the maybe one of two people there who write Go kind of proficiently. So what I've done is written like test harnesses and bug testing rigs in Go, but we don't have it. I like to. But it's a very big like Java shop. So if it's not JV, I'm not interested. Or in Python or in Ruby. Or in a hundred different other languages they're using. <laughs> That's a ten year old company. They've got a lot of legacy code. So they are a Java shop on Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So like in JMS, yeah. JMS to 